This meeting is being recorded. Okay, so guys, this moment right here from yesterday, how awesome is this? Just awesome. seeing Toronto, the nicest fan base in America, handing it over to the one kid who is not a jerk on the meanest fan base in America, the New York Yankees. And they are not America. the meanest fan base in America. Come <laughs> on. So... I'm a Yankee fan. I can say that. So, uh, so am I. So point. I can argue that point. <laughs> I can argue that point, but it's it's pretty close. Okay, oh, that yeah, ends great, our whole great moment. Great, yeah, you mentioned it. Great moment. Jay wrote about it. Uh, posted some links more on Facebook. Pretty damn awesome. And on Let's Twitter, start. basically under the headline of "How can you not be romantic about baseball?" Yes. Now let's bitch about everything else. The playoffs continue. I'm Stephen <laughs> Rabinowitz. I'm Jay Kaplan. And I'm Anthony Strait. All right. This is on the sports lines. It's our playoff edition. All right. So the NBA playoffs are in full swing uh, for the conference semifinals. And getting it out the way now, the hunt for Lord Stanley's chalice, also known to regular people on this show as the Stanley Cup playoffs, has just started. We got both covered tonight, along with a team that has won as many playoff games as the three of us have, the Brooklyn Nets. Let's go, boys. You want to look at the definition of overachievers in the dictionary. Let's look at the New York Rangers, a team that this time last season we decried made one of the worst offseason moves in firing their coach and GM. Well, 110 points and a second place division placing later. Maybe it was a much better idea to get the Rangers to the next level. However, then came last mm-hmm. night, the first playoff game in MST in five years at a 4 to 3 triple overtime loss to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Thanks, Igor Shisterkin, and your 79 saves, the <laughs> second most in a playoff game ever. You get a zero. Thank God the Rangers don't get two losses for almost going six periods. So we'll mix a little bit of our game one stuff in with uh, our analysis of what the team needs to do for the playoffs. <clears throat> uh, let's start with uh, Anthony. No, let's start no, with Jack. Okay, let's start with Jay. Sorry about that. You gotta start with the good, folks. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah, well, everything has to start with the good. And, left, and surprisingly, Jay is the one that's going to do it. Jay, what thing have the Rangers has done during the regular season? What's the good that needs to carry over to the playoffs? And uh, what has I mean, that, you know, that, that's, that's power play efficiency. I mean, we know that, you know, the Rangers will rely on stellar play from their number one netminder, you know, and uh, Rabbi, as you said, uh, Igor did... I don't know how he could have done any more than he actually did last night, um, you know, in that three overtime loss. But a big reason for New York's success this season has been their ability to take full advantage when they have the man advantage. They had the NHL's fourth best power play this season by success rate, converting at 25.2 percent. They ranked fifth in offensive generation from a volume and quality perspective, according, according to evolving-hockey.com. But they only had the 28th most opportunities, 218, which works out to only about 2.66 per game. And they only spent a little over four minutes per game on the, on the power play. Here's a comparison for, with a team by a team that I will get to later in the show. That's Colorado. They led the NHL with 279 power play opportunities, 3.4 per game, and they spent five and a half minutes per game on the power play. So the Rangers were pretty efficient when given the man, given man advantage chances, and they had to be because, as we're all well aware, they struggle in five on five. I will hold off on the uh, the advanced slash next gen stats for for later in the segment. That's a small spoiler alert. Um, though they did improve on that down the stretch. Um, but, you know, those, those struggles will put more pressure on the Rangers when they get a power play opportunity. And their number one power play unit of Chris Kreider, who scored half of his 52 goals, 26 on the power play, forward Mike Zabanajad, who was top 10 with 15 power play goals and led the NHL with 33.4 power play shots per 60 minutes. Defenseman Adam Fox, who quarterbacks the unit, third in the NHL in power play assists with 33. And Rabbi's favorite guy, the bread man, forward Archemi Panarin, who was fifth in the power play assists department with 32. Ryan Strom rounds out that 
quintet. They play about 70% of the available power play minutes and will be count the ones counted on to convert those chances into goals. The issue here, guys, is that they're facing a very disciplined P Penguins team that does not draw a lot of penalties. Or should I say take a lot of penalties? Second least in the NHL in penalties taken, 253 penalty minutes, 566, one of only two teams with less than 600 minutes of penalties. And penalty minutes per game, only six minutes and 54 seconds. So the Rangers will not likely get a lot of chances on the power play. And when they do, they'll be up against the Penguins penalty kill. That was number three in the NHL at 84.4% and allowed the least number of power play goals this season. They tied with Carolina and San Jose with just 33. The Rangers did convert their only power play chance last night in game one. Adam Fox at the 919 mark in the first period. And they won the special teams battle overall. They had a shorthanded goal by Kreider at the 1707 mark in the second period. And they held Pittsburgh to one for four on the power play. But one chance at the man advantage was not enough. The Pens won the five on five, three goals to one in taking the game. Can a Rangers team that didn't draw a lot of penalties induce a Penguins team that didn't take a lot into taking more penalties and thus giving them more chances on the power play and giving that number one unit more chances to light the lamp as efficiently as they did during the regular season? Who knows? But that's what I'll be watching for, as I usually do, during the chase for Lord Stanley's chalice. Don't, Rabbi, don't worry. I got you contractually covered tonight. Just don't say it more than this. Um, Anthony, give no me, uh, great. Anthony, give me a negative for the Rangers season that needs to stop. And probably you saw it in game one as well. Well, we, well, Jay just alluded to it. The, the five on five play, you look at the, it, we look at game one, it was really like a microcosm of, of how the Rangers have played when it's been an even strength all season. And in the post period, they came out flying around. You saw them with the, Ryan Reeves was just all over the place. I mean, he pretty much could have been wearing a Penguins jersey as much as he was uh, initiating the contact and getting into the player, the Penguins players throughout the first period. And he really set the tempo for, the, for a Ranger team that has struggled in five-on-five five on five situations and they eventually turned into a two-goal lead. The problem is with the Rangers five-on-five five, has been consistency. They have been very lackadaisical at times. And it showed in the second period, they allowed, they allowed 20, what, 25 shots in the second period, which is, which is just un, unheard of. And who knows how bad that the second period could have been if Igor Shostokin doesn't make a few out of his mind saves to at least keep the game close or tied at that point. Um, as far as the offense on 5 on 5, they were 18th all season long, which is a huge drop off when you consider. This is a Ranger team that have taken advantage of the special teams, whether it be the power play or the or um being shorthanded, as Kreider did last uh, mm -hmm. uh in game one mm -hmm. last night. Um the, also you talk about this, the five of five goal differential is only plus 10. It's a it's a plus minus 10, which is again another drop off in itself. And of the 16 playoff teams, they've allowed the second most uh, shots on goal in five on five situations. So barely, so pretty much because they have a Vesla Trophy candidate um, minding the net more often than not, even as Alexander Georgiev, who is a pretty good backup in his own right, the Rangers really have gotten away with a lot of undisciplined plays, some silly turnovers. You saw that uh, quite a bit last night as well. Um, and, and you think, and also the Penguins top line just did a number on the Rangers uh, from the second period on in that in, in game one, they generated 24 shots on goal. That's how I shot the, the Rangers 24 to nine. That combination of Crosby, Gensel, and Russ was just very, just all over the place. I mean, Crosby, um, on the first goal, you saw a little undisciplined play, two guys chasing after Crosby and leaving Gensel wide open in front of net. The second goal was, was a case of the Rangers just falling asleep on defense with and getting relaxed with Crosby uh, with the puck. And you cannot do that. Look, Crosby, and obviously, um, Rabbi, you'll talk about it more uh, uh, to make your point. Crosby is still Sidney Crosby. I mean, you got out of his ability to make plays uh, with, for, for, and create opportunities for his teammates. I think the Rangers, I, I think Joe uh, Gallant, pretty much kind of overlooked that, that aspect. I think he tried to stick to what worked in the regular season. Um, and it, it backfired on him a little bit. I mean, the Rangers are going to have to make some adjustments as far as matching up with the top line. But also, they got to 
they've got to be a little more disciplined. They've got to clean up the turnovers. And they and it's, and it's a lot of opportunities they had in the third period and the first two overtimes where if they was able to connect on a pass, they might have gotten a couple of a decent scoring opportunities. But the Rangers fought when they've been on even strength. And, and I think that's one of the one the one area where the pain was having advantage in the series. The Rangers gotta have to approve, particularly defensively in front of he was a circle and try to prevent him having to contest so many shots on goal because I, I don't know I don't know how many I don't know if Shisuke have legs after <laughs> going through triple overtime to even last uh, through the rest of the series if he's gonna get peppered with shots all night. Yeah, I mean, and Anthony, yeah. you, you nailed it on the head, and you talked you talked about the five on five from the defensive point of view. Here's so here you know here are three next gen stats for from the offensive side. Um, <laughs> Rangers during the regular season were below 50%, which is the mid, <clears throat> the NHL average in Corsi four percentage, which shows how well a team was or was not controlling the puck. Over Overall scoring yeah. chances for oh, high danger. Those who that. are not controlling the puck, you're not controlling the puck, you're not getting enough scoring chances, and you're not getting that type of the scoring chances that usually lead to a goal, which is what high danger scoring chances are. So if you are going to struggle in those three key areas, and you're going to struggle on defense in five on five and keeping you know teams away from your goaltender, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a rough series. The Penguins are a bad matchup um, for the Rangers, Rabbi. They, I don't think they are. I actually think that just that first game was just, they had the right move. They had everything going. And then that second period, they dropped off. Also, one of the things that's noticed is the guy who has had all of the playoff troubles for the Penguins is injured. So Tristan Jerry, who at one point this season at a regular season game, gave up four goals in five minutes at Madison Square Garden. Not having a play brings the unknown. And speaking of the unknown, my play for the watch is somebody who I would never have picked just less than 24 hours ago. And he's probably going to start game two for the Penguins. And that is journeyman Louis Domingue. Domingue last is night. <laughs> the, yeah, so I late, last it. night. I mean, it was most of my USP and I had to bring it up. Uh boy, there's so many ways to go here, but let's uh, let's get the backstory. 16 saves last night, having to come in liter almost literally out of the cold for an injured Casey DeSmith, who had a lower body injury in the middle of the second overtime. You come into what is essentially your most important playoff game in your career. He did have one playoff game that he played in believe in Tampa Bay in 2018 where he made seven stops. He had 17 in just the very less than six, in the less than 17 minutes that he played in this game. And he was only 30. So one thing that you're going to, and yes, he did eat spicy pork in. And broccoli. I mean. <laughs> a full meal in the locker room in between uh, periods five and six. I, I, I got to wonder, game, Rob, I just, wonder which is the more impressive feat, those saves, or the fact that he's actually able to keep that meal down? <laughs> well, either way, Louis had a 9.24 save percentage as well playing for the Penguins AHL affiliate and did have two spot, spot starts this year. And if you're going to play a game that is probably not going to be defensive-oriented when one goalie goes for 79 saves in game number one, you have to think there will be stuff in Igor Shostakovich's tank, but it won't be running at Vesna level full. And so that case, you got to take advantage of a goalie who's really not not really into, has not really experienced. He's played with the Rangers a bunch because he was the goalie of the Devils at points last year in 2019. In 2019. And by the way, uh, the Penguins called up a goalie, Alex Dorio, the Oreo today for Lopes Bear Scranton. And you don't bring up another goalie if you're not going to start if you're not going to start the other guy in game two that up. So that's what I'm looking at because <laughs> I still think the Rangers are in good shape, but note this in series that any team has won in three overtimes or more, that team has won this series 90% of the time. 
All right. I so want to know how large or small that sample size is, Rabbi. <laughs> not that it's still not a good sample size. When it's <laughs> but, still by the way, yeah, by the way, here's a here's a range of trivia. The triple overtime game that they played uh, game one was actually 10 years to the day. They played the last triple overtime game against Washington wow. in round two of 2012. Marion Gabarek scored the game winner goal at almost what 12 o'clock that night. Uh a little after 12, 12 o'clock a.m. Uh, local <laughs> time here in New York. So that's a little, <laughs> um, I tell you, anniversary that I think the Rangers would, would like to avoid it. But no um, I think no. it's a 20 years, and I think it's almost, it's either 19 or 20 years to the day, uh, to the day last night of the six overtime game that the Penguins and Flyers played back in 2002. I have to get the exact date of that, but it was, it was on that date. Okay. The rest of the Eastern Conference playoffs, oh boy, 100-point teams all around. It is the first time we have a conference playoffs exclusively of 100-point teams. There's the bouncer at the club, and you can't get in unless you have 100 points. That's the only way you get on the damn list. All right, let's examine these series. Jay, the lovable underachievers and the Toronto Maple Leafs are facing one of the most successful franchises in sports, the Tampa Bay Lightning. I have the series as 1-0. I believe it is now 1-1 after tonight. So it is 1-1. The uh, Lightning won game 2-5-3. So 1-1, Jay, what are you looking for for the rest of this? Um, you know, coming into this series, the thing that I was, the storyline that I was going to be paying attention to is whether or not the Leafs dynamic duo of, of Matthews and Marner could finally break Toronto's first round jinx. Toronto's not won a Stanley Cup playoff series since 2004 and have lost in the first round each of the past five seasons, being eliminated by the Canadians in seven last season after being up three games to one. That's the most recent and it was egregious. The, that's the cloud hanging over this series and these playoffs as a whole for Toronto and will be until they can shake that aforementioned jinx. As you noted, Rabbi alluded to, they had a terrific regular season, setting team records for wins, 54 points, 115, and finishing second in the Atlantic, seven points behind the President's Trophy winning Florida Panthers. And as you noted, they open, the reward for that is opening up against the back-to-back -back Stanley Cup champion, Lightning, who finished five points behind the Leafs. No pressure, right? We know that stars have to play like stars in the Stanley Cup playoffs, which for Toronto, as I alluded to, starts with forwards Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. Matthews led the NHL in, goal, in total goals with 60 and even strength goals with 44, led the Maple Leafs with 106 points. Marner was second in goals and points for the Leafs, 35 and 97, led them in assists with 62. Matthews had three goals and four assists in the three regular season meetings with Tampa Bay. Marner had a goal and four assists as the team split the season series 2-2. But as recent history has told us, excellent regular season numbers by both the team and their stars has not translated to postseason success. Last year, Matthews and Marner combined for a single goal by Matthews in seven games in the series loss to the Canadians. Marner specifically had not scored in his last 18 playoff games since lighting the lamp in game one of the Leafs Eastern Conference first round series against the Boston Bruins on April 11, 2019 prior to game one this series. There's no doubting how talented this twosome is, but the pressure of playoff failures past is the mental roadblock they need to overcome. Getting rookie forward Michael Bunting back sooner rather than later for this series could help with that. He practiced on Sunday, but was held out of game one. Rabbi, can you check and let me know if he played tonight in game two? Who was uh, this? Uh, Michael Bunting. Yes, he, was, he did. He had a goal. There you go. All right. As he attempted to return from an undisclosed injury, which, as Rabbi just said, he did tonight and got on the, and lit the lamp. Bunting led all NHL rookies in points during the regular season with 63, 23 goals, 40 assists. And the feistiness he brings as the third member of Toronto's number one line alongside Matthews and Marner, and along with his ability to provoke opponents into penalties and creating space in the offensive zone for Toronto's dynamic duo, gives the Leafs uh, offense a dynamic they did not have in last season's playoffs. Since they defeated the Ottawa Senators in seven games in the Eastern Conference spot quarters back in 04, the Leafs had played 45 postseason games, all ending in series losses. Off, they were off to a good start. In this year's playoffs, winning game one, 5-0 behind their dynamic duo before tonight's loss to Tampa Bay. 
Matthews had two goals and an assist in the opener. Marner had a goal and two assists. And the Leafs dominated the special teams battle, going five for five on the penalty kill, including a five-minute first period kill spearheaded by Marner, along with a shorthanded goal by David Kampf and a power play goal by Matthews, both in the second period. Look, for this series on paper, Toronto is the better team. Special teams, even strength, top end talent, line depth, you name it. The edge goes to the Maple Leafs everywhere except maybe in goal. But we know how playoff time is lightning time and the champs will not be an easy out as evidenced by the fact that they even the series up tonight. <clears throat> well, Corey Perry, Brayden points, Nikita Kucherov and a four point effort for Victor had been. These are the players who you you lost in the big game. And uh, And this is what Toronto is up against as they try to break this, this jinx. And you don't know, it's not a jinx. It's a bad organization. You don't really trust Toronto in situations like this. Me and Anthony have joked about the Maple Leafs for years. (laughs) Anthony, the Carolina Hurricanes are no joke. They are a trendy Stanley Cup final pick, including by yours truly. (laughs) Chef's kiss on that pick for now. (laughs) You finally got the right so far. (laughs) For now. But few teams in hockey have looked better in April than the Boston Bruins. However, the series is 2 nothing, and the Bruins have just been manhandled by the Panthers. So, I mean, by the uh, Hurricanes so far. How does this, can, how can this change and how can this be a closer series? Or will it be? Well, that's the thing. I mean, you're talking about the Hurricanes, so the, was the Metropolitan Division winners, and, uh, and a team that had the best defense and allowed the fewest goals against throughout the season – going up against a Boston team that had gave the four fewest goals but have struggled offensively, particularly on a power play, where they at one point went to an 0 for 39 stretch. I mean, they were just woefully bad. They scored a power play goal tonight uh, to kind of give them a little bit of life in, this, in game two. But then you think about the, 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 the Hurricanes – Actually lost the, the starting goalie before the season, the postseason started. Mm-hmm. Richard Anderson, who won 35 games for them, uh, has a lower body injury. So in comes Antti Ranta, who started game one and, and played phenomenally. He gets knocked out of game two. Mm-hmm. Thanks to uh, a, a mix-up with uh, David Pasternak, uh, kind of going up high with a stick and knocking him out of the game. In comes 22-year-old Pryor Kushinov, all of all of young spry Russian and very little English uh, comes in with 30 saves uh, and a great performance. And the Carolina Hurricanes up two games to none in the series. But if you look at it like this, and get in the first game, Boston outshot Carolina uh, uh, pretty, uh, in, the, in the first game, 36 to 25. And, and to come out in this game, they actually started out pretty well, but uh, the, the the Hurricanes is just out, just kind of outclass and really had Boston's number in this <clears throat> in this um, in this matchup all season long. Think about this: the Hurricanes and the Bruins have played now five games, three in the regular season and now two in the postseason. In 220 minutes of game time action, the Boston Bruins have not held a lead at any point in these matchups. That kind of tells you how. Surprisingly lopsided, this this matchup has been all season long. They look the the Hurricanes, the star players have shown up. Sebastian Osho with two goals tonight. Um, he's been and obviously he's kind of one of the engines that kind of make the Hurricanes go. But I'm looking for more out of Brad Marchand. I mean, he, he really hasn't had much going on. Pasternak hasn't really had much going on outside of Mixell and Ronta. The 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 Bruins tonight uh, in game two. Literally looked like they lost their composure, which is surprising for a team just three years removed from being in the Seneca final. Um, they they've got to they've got to regroup. They got to get their offense to go go and get something generated. Maybe going up against the third straight goalie may help them out a little bit. Maybe going back to the TD guy and may rejuvenate that offense. But right now, they have got to they have really got to get something going on the on the offensive side of the park because. Um, right now, with the one for seven in a power, uh, power play situation in this series, um, this, this series may not last long. Uh, right now, Carolina has really had the upper hand uh, through the first two games. Don't forget about noted uh, former Ranger and former man who I actually respect, Tony D'Angelo, going for three assists. Oh, by the way, tonight. D'Angelo and oh, Jesper Foss, another former Ranger, uh, yes. contributing uh, big tonight. Yeah, that team is just 
stacked. I love seeing uh, Sebastian Aho those, and Nita Ryan and, and Nico Nita Those damn playing. jokes. <laughs> yeah, those damn those damn jerks are a team that you wish would never was never in your division. Okay. So fun stat before we continue and talk about uh, the Panthers Washington Capitals series. This is the first time since the realignment of the NHL in 2014 that the that both the Capitals and Penguins were starting the playoffs on the road. They were both they were both without home ice advantage and 24 hours and right in the beginning of the playoffs they gained advantage. So. The Washington Capitals. Have you ever seen a team with that much talent playing in a nothing to lose situation? They could be one of the most talented eight seeds, or in this case, wild card twos that we've ever seen in the postseason. And when the team that you're playing hasn't won a series since Anthony and I were a spry 11 years old, that's 1996 when the Panthers <laughs> made their last Stanley Cup. And, oh, by the way, they've lost six playoff series since then. You find yourselves in a little bit of trouble, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the, can the Panthers overcome their exuberance and actually, you know, bog down because what did they basically do last night? They went into a five-on-three, three and a half minutes into the game. And that, in this playoffs, in these playoffs, if you end up at a five-on-three, you're dead. The Rangers were dead last night, and eventually they didn't score on the five on three, but they scored, and they actually technically scored a power play goal, but they basically scored at the very end of the power play, and Washington made it one nothing. Florida did come back to make it two to one, but Florida just never looked in control, never looked like the team that we've seen going in. Sergey Bobrovsky always is going to be the question of iron during his days in Columbus, where he looked really good. And then really disappointing. He was only one two and zero in last year's twenty twenty one postseason, and only had a had a five three three goals against average. He didn't have a bad game. He made thirty four saves on thirty seven shots against a very good offensive team, but they just turned the puck over a ton. They turned it over thirteen times. They only turned it over seven times as an average during the regular season. They're a team that just kept going and going and going and they held on to the puck themselves too they only had six turnovers tom wilson who scored the first goal and is the the poster child of love for everybody in the new york rangers organization did have an injury at the end of game number one so they'll be shorthanded but Kobe, washington capitals little no pressure whatsoever looking for another playoff series victory. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a good combination to anybody, does it? Mm-hmm. Nope. And that's, again, experience has mattered in these playoffs so far. We've seen it. All right. The Western Conference has a tiny bit more of a gap between the haves and the have of lessers. I don't think it would be <laughs> have nots in this situation. <laughs> And it doesn't include the Golden Knights. Sorry, Anthony. But we love this time of year. So the Cup Finals can't go chalk, right? Right? Except if you watch the Colorado Avalanche last night, the team who didn't win the President's Cup, which is probably a good thing, because only two teams who have won the President's Cup since the 90s have won it all. But the Colorado Avalanche, we're going to see one of the most successful NHL franchises in the West in the past decade in this playoffs and the Natural Predators. And then I would say, what's the key? But Jay, seven goals in game one, including five pretty much in the first period. Ugh, how can the Predators so, make this? <laughs> so, so basically, Rabbi, in the Western Conference, we're saying it's the Avs and the Avnots. No, because the Flames <laughs> are pretty good. So I will I'll, I'll hold off on the abs and the abs, but that could be a good headline eventually. Fair enough. Um, the storyline for me coming into this series um, was, I was, you know, despite how well the abs played during the regular season, I was looking at how do they get past a team that seemed to have their number in the regular season, beating them three times. Um, you know, as, as, as you noted, Rabbi, uh, the Az came into the playoffs sporting the NHL's second best record, 56, 19, and seven, second most points, 119 behind Florida. Their reward was those pesky Nashville Predators who were responsible for three of the Az 19 losses, the most against any other team Colorado faced this season. 
That being said, the Avs came into this series knowing they wouldn't face UC Saros in goal for the Preds. He went 2-0 and with a 2.94 goals against average and a 914 save percentage in two games against Colorado. The Preds starting net minor sustained an injury that will keep him out of the first round. And like every injury in the, in the Stanley Cup playoffs, it's vague and undefined. Um, through 68 games, Saros had a 12.6 goals above expected, saved 12.6 goals above expected, earned throughout his 35 quality starts, led the league with 11 steals, where his play bested the team's final goal differential. His replacement, David Riddich, through 17 games, 891 save percentage, allowed almost seven goals above expected. That's a swing of 5.8 wins going from Saros to Riddich, and the Avs, as Rabbi alluded to, exploited the heck out of it right out of the gate. Colorado's prolific offense, number four in the NHL in goals with 308, starts with their number one line of Nathan McKinnon, Mikko Ratanen, and Gabriel Landeskog, which despite McKinnon missing 17 games, Ratanen missing seven, Landeskog missing 31, all top 30 goals, and they had a 58% expected goals rate and outscored opponents 19-9 on five on five. McKinnon is actually in some heady company when it comes to playoff production. 69 points, 28 goals, 41 assists, and 50 NHL playoff games. His 1.38 points per game average is third in NHL history among players who have played at least 35 playoff games. The two guys ahead of him on that list, eh, you know, guys you may, uh, get, a couple of guys you may have to scratch your head to remember. Wayne Gretzky, 1.84, and Mario Lemieux, 1.61. Oh, and his line mate, Rattanen, is seventh on that list at 1.21 points per game. Colorado's power play, which I noted in the Rangers segment, was number one in the NHL, but struggled at the end of the regular season. Got a chance two minutes into the game. The Avs' top power play unit needed 11 seconds for all five skaters to touch the puck and for that puck to find the back of the net off the stick of McKinnon. That opened up the floodgates. Devin Tays fired a puck pass Riddich on from the offensive zone faceoff circle. Barely 22 seconds later, and Colorado was up two zip. Fastest two goals. From the start of a playoff game in Avalanche Nordique's combined franchise history. By the 8.30 mark of the first period, Colorado hit the goal-scoring trifecta. Power play goal from McKinnon, even strength goal from Taze, and a shorthanded goal from Andrew Cagliano. That number one line I mentioned earlier combined for eight points in game one, three goals, five assists, which is the type of damage you'd expect from a trio with this next-gen stat that's going to boggle your mind. Their combined worth is 13.6 wins which is 1.2 more wins than all 12 of Nashville's forward. Add insult to injury, Colorado's number one blue liner, Kale Maker, had 20 at a 28 goal, 58 to 86 point regular season, chipped in with a three point night, one goal and two assists. And yeah, let's not forget about goalie Darcy Kemper, who was tied for fourth in wins with 37, fifth in save percentage at 921, and goal save above expected 16. And yet he was a bit of a question mark coming into this series. Because he had gone 0 and 0, 0 and 2 against the Predators with a sorry 0 and 2 against the Predators with a 4.23 goals against average and only an 870 save percentage in the regular season. Question answer: Kemper stoned Nashville on 23 of their 25 shots on goal. That's a 9.25 save percentage, right on his season average. All that offensive firepower. I didn't even get into the contributions of guys like Nazem Kadri and Naturi Lakonin and then Valeria Nishukin, but. Kemper locking things down between the pipes, plus Colorado being finally healthy. And that's the big key for them, guys. That combination, that's a terrifying scenario, not just for Nashville, but for the rest of the Western Conference and the entire NHL in the chase for Lawrence Stanley's chalice. Great network for you. Um, so I do have <laughs> to say, though. <laughs> you uh, gave me two, Rabbi. I'm taking my two. <laughs> you're done. Um, I will have to say, though, yikes with the abs. The fully healthy yeah. abs team is the best of the West. I don't think it's a done deal because the pressure is going to be on the abs, and you don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. But Jesus, that nope. game last night is <clears throat> pure perfection for them. Okay. Anthony, the St. Louis Blues and Minnesota Wild are becoming the version of the Spider Man meme as uh, they were both huge down the stretch in the NHL season. Now they made an interesting seven game series. Blues dominated game one. They already snagged home ice while doing the same exact thing to the Blues in game two. So it's essentially a five game series with the Blues with home ice advantage. What's the key? 
Yeah, well, one of the things I was looking at going into the series was the fact that these were really two evenly matched teams that was pretty much on a like kind of parallel universe, if you will. Uh, I guess since you've been a Spider-Man reference, uh, as far as how they finished the season, both teams finished the season red mm-hmm. hot, particularly after the trade deadline, uh, where both teams won over 20 games. Um, but here's the thing: these three teams, these two teams played each other three times, two going past regulation, and the other, remember, this this was the Winter Classic matchup on New Year's night uh, back in January. Uh, St. Louis winning that game 6-4 in Target Field. One, and Minnesota, they've been driven all season long by the top line of Kapisov, Zuccarello, and uh, Ryan Hartman, combining for um, three, 100, 105 of the Minnesota Wilds, 305 goals throughout the regular season. Kaprizov by himself, 108 points, 47 goals, uh, and a goal with 61 assists. When you look at the St. Louis Blues, this is a team that uh, played just as well. And in game one, I mean, even when uh, Vinny Husso uh, being the um, being the star goalie, they just dominated um, from the start. David Perron got a uh, got a hat trick, and, and, this, and, and they was able to just really dictate the the tempo and really shut down Minnesota's offense. By the way, if there was any, um, the, the, if the Minnesota Wild does have a weak point, we talk about the Rangers being so good at the power play. Minnesota's the opposite. They were one of the worst power play teams in their regular season at just 76, uh, um, just more than 20, 27%. And the penalty kills was even worse. They were 25th in the NHL. And right now, they're actually the worst among the 16 teams. They gave out two power play goals uh, in game one. Tonight in game two, however, I mean, that was one period in. Uh, they're up three, three nothing. They're able to get uh, the power play going, get the, the top line going, create police off of the goal. So this, is, I feel like this is an evenly matched up. Um, Nick Letty was one of uh, Nick Letty's um, is a is a guy that I'm kind of keeping an eye on for St. Louis. Uh, in a, in a team in a, in a series that is really pretty meant to your offense, uh, a defenseman. <coughs> Excuse me, like my allergies are bothering me right now. But um, the, a defenseman. Uh, being able to play 20 minutes on ice and maybe being able to take, take away one of Minnesota's top weapons may actually play a factor in the series. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I have the two Canadian series in the West. Let's start with the series that is currently one nothing to the road team, and that's the Edmonton Oilers and Los Angeles Kings. The Edmonton Oilers... Both the Toronto Maple Leafs and Edmonton Oilers have pressure on them for different reasons. For the Maple Leafs, it's to get the monkey off of their back because of the talent that they have, even though Tampa Bay is Tampa Bay. So we kind of know how much of a magic that's going to be. For the Oilers, it's you need to get a playoff series victory with Connor McDavid, the on tricycle <laughs> for organization. McDavid has just not shown up in the playoffs in the past and has lost series, <laughs> including in the bubble, two years ago to Chicago, who is a team that still hasn't really reached the peak of beating the Edmonton Oilers in a a very quick series like they did back then. This team was struggling big time going into 2022, and then they fired their head coach, they brought in Jay Woodcroft, and the Oilers just went 26-9-3, and they had a good run with Mike Smith in goal, Connor McDavid, had the most points in the league again and everything looked good last night wasn't that good the mike smith let up a bunch of goals in the game including the last one which uh, gave the kings a game one victory now i know you're wondering have we seen the kings in the playoffs for a while and the answer is no we haven't los angeles kings have been a part of a trio of terrible California teams that we've seen in the last few years. This is the first time we've seen one of them in the playoffs for a while. And as I said to Anthony, if you could imagine who the team that is keeping the crypto.com slash Staples Center open the longest in 2022's playoff season, if you thought the Kings would beat the Lakers and Clippers in that situation at the beginning of the year, I think you would have gotten four digit odds on that. But yeah, the Kings are just a very well put 
together team. And uh, last night, <coughs> it was just no exception, including the, yes, 36-year-old Jonathan Quick, who had his best season since in about four years. 259 G goals against average, a 910 save percentage. Did start only 46 games. Cal Peterson got the nod in the other 35. But the Los Angeles Kings were a very, very steady team during the season. They have not too many big stars. They have Victor Albertson, and they are just, they're there. But you also have veterans like Duncan Keith. You have Brandon Lemieux, who gained, who got them a big goal last night. They're going to be a very interesting team in these playoffs. But this is all about the Oilers. Oilers need to win now, or that team can overcome a lot more questions. Flame Stars. Now, this is another interesting series because... The Calgary Flames and Dallas Stars both didn't even make the playoffs last year, and they actually played a very good seven games, uh, six game series in the bubble two years ago. But right now, Calgary has a ton of one. They have a bunch of 100 point scorers on this team. They are very much so going to be the, they are very much so the favorites in this series. They are just pretty good and last night they know how to play offensive defense because it, uh, because last night a total of 43 shots were shot by both teams in the whole entire game which is probably less than a period for the Penguins and Rangers last night and they had a melee at the end of the first period when Calgary's biggest star Matthew Kachuk shoved Dallas's John Klingberg onto the ice and Dallas is older. Dallas is a bit older than the Flames. And they are, they have a lot of stars who are in the twilight of their careers. They just made the playoffs. You have Joe Pavelski, 37 years old, 81 points today in two games. You have just a bunch of players out there for the stars that are looking for one last run. They did make the Stanley Cup finals two years ago, but the Flames are heavy favorites in this series. And there's not too many teams who can challenge the Avalanche out, out in the West. They're one of them, especially if you've ever seen that Calgary crowd. They are loud. So let's see what happens. It's going to be a very interesting Western Conference playoff. By the way, before I, got very all unpredictable. Ch- yeah, before I got all choked up, figuratively and literally, by the way, Nick Liddy, uh late scratch for game two uh, tonight in St. Louis and Minnesota. And I uh, I think we're seeing what's going on with his. I think we're absence. seeing why that that's the case now. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I'm very interested to see how this West shakes out because again, there's a lot of teams with a lot of pressure on them. Colorado doesn't have a great postseason history over the last few years in the Nathan McKinnon era. Uh, Edmonton, what they've done in the past few years, and even Minnesota, who has had a lot of talent but not really any playoff victory, so. A lot of teams with a lot of pressure. All right, moving on. Let's go to the NBA. You know, they have playoffs, too. They just don't have a <laughs> playoffs. They just, really? have Larry O'Brien. <laughs> they just have a Larry O'Brien trophy that goes with it. They're a tiny bit more into their postseason. It's a very it's a different format that had to do with the late start to the hockey season. But you're probably going to see this more and more now that basketball and hockey are controlled by the same two entities for both playoffs. So it works out pretty well. All right. So the top four seeds in both the East and the West have all made it to the conference semifinals, but chalk is never on the menu here and on the sports lines, and I don't think we're going to be ordering it anytime soon. Anthony, just like the St. Louis Blues uh, Minnesota Wild Series, I'm going to just put this in a very simple perspective. The Boston Celtics and Milwaukee Bucks. Bucks kicked the Celtics ass in game one. Celtics kicked the Bucks ass in game two. So... It's a five-game series with the Bucks with home court advantage. What do you expect? Well, in, in both cases, uh, it was the the key matchup was how was Boston going to defend Giannis Antetokounmpo? You think about the Celtics and how they were able to shut down. Sorry, Minnesota scored another goal, so it's now four nothing. Um, how Boston was able to defend Kevin Durant was basically they threw bodies at him 
And it basically made life difficult for Kevin Durant in round one um, against Brooklyn. But here's the thing, Giannis Antetokounmpo is a much more adept playmaker than Kevin Durant is. And, Kevin, and also Giannis is more willing to drive to the basket. In game one, um, Giannis' playmaking is what really won the game against Boston. We look at the fact that he didn't have a, a great efficient shooting night. Um, give me just a second for the stats. Uh, go up. Uh, up. Here we go. Lost my. Uh, he scored twenty four points, but he uh, he had twenty five shots. I mean, two twenty five shots. He scored twenty four points, but it was his passing and his playmaking and getting twelve assists that kind of really opened up the Milwaukee Bucks offense and 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 was able to get a lot of open opportunities. I think that was really the big difference in the first game. The second game in game two was support well. As again, Boston is able to take away Giannis' efficiency as far as the scoring. They have more bias to throw at him. I mean, no mark is smart. So Grant, so Grant Williams is another guy that comes into play. He's only 6'4", but he's a, he's a strong guy. And Giannis struggled when he was guarded by Grant Williams. He actually uh, caused Austin Cooper to miss nine of his first 10 shots on the night in game two. Uh, Jalen Brown uh, struggled in game one. Came back with a big game two and uh leading the and leading the, the the lopsided win. It's gonna be interesting though, because there have been rumors of Chris Middleton maybe coming back for game three, maybe game four uh of this series, but he has not practiced whatsoever. So it's going to be interesting to see how Milwaukee adjusts to um to Boston um defense and how Austin Cooper has been played because Giannis, is, 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 his game has evolved now. I mean, he still scored 28 points, didn't shoot the ball well in either game, but he's a much more playmaker, a playmaker. He can shoot from outside. That whole wall keeping him out of the out of the paint doesn't really work anymore. But also, they need they also with the Celtics on the Celtics side, they got to get more consistency out of Jalen Brown because he's had some he's had he's had big game uh, big game two and game four against. Against Brooklyn, not so much in the, in the odd number of games, games one and three. And obviously, he's struggling in game one, had a great game two. They're going to need a little more from Jalen Brown, especially um, to comp- to uh, to kind of um, complement Jason Tatum as far as scoring. But also, Boston has become so reliant on three point shooting, which is surprising. They didn't take many two pointers in game one, it took t- a ton of threes. And Milwaukee dared them to try to make the same, uh, the the make the make those threes a game two and set the back by. And they shot with fifty percent behind a three point arc, I believe. So uh, for game three, I think those are two adjustments you gotta look at as far as Milwaukee is. What are they gonna do to adjust to Boston defense? Because we definitely didn't see uh, see Brooklyn able to make any adjustments. And for Boston, it's gonna be. Um, I have to fall in love with the three-point shooting so much. They didn't forget that Tatum and Brown are two of the best finishers around the basket. Maybe they should try to get to the basket a little more. But um, if there's one thing that these two teams do possess, it's length. I mean, Boston was able to get to the basket at will against a small Brooklyn team. Milwaukee have the size up front that kind of takes that away. But as far as the, uh, the Milwaukee Bucks, Boston has the length and the size and the uh, fast perimeter defense. So um, I'm expecting this series to go at least six. I don't know who's going to – I'm not going to pick a winner because I think it's still kind of a toss-up right now. Um, the key is – it's going to be two keys as far as how either team can adjust, but whether or not if Milwaukee can get Chris Middleton back at some point in the series. Let me just say this, though. The reason why Boston took all of those threes, and they took a lot of threes, game one, two, and were not be able to go inside – is after you get past the defense of Drew Holiday uh, on the perimeter, then you have this thing called the Giannis in the middle, and you need and Brooke Lopez. You didn't realize that there's not too many people in the game that are defensive game changers. Giannis is one of them. Giannis is probably the best two way player in the league, and that's what stopped game one. But Celtics made adjustments. They beat up Giannis tremendously in that first half to make the second half pretty much insignificant. Okay, Jay, Philadelphia 76ers six days ago got the high of coming out of Scotiabank Arena to pass the Toronto Raptors. 
Then Doc Rivers decided to leave Joel Embiid in the game with less than four minutes to go. And now comes the huge low that is making this series versus Miami very, very, very hard. Yeah, you know, you, you, <clears throat> we all know. I mean, we talked about it on the last show about how Scotiabank Arena has been a house of horrors for for the 76ers. And, you know, you know, they they escaped with a 4-2 series win in that first round, series, you know, in the first round, you know, and they were all having the high of that. And then came the news. Joel Embiid, who led Philly, going for 26 points, 11 boards, shooting 52% from the floor, 83% from the line on almost 10 trips all while battling a torn ligament in his right thumb, would be out indefinitely with a right orbital fracture and mild concussion sustained in that series clinching win. Uh, on offense, Embiid being out puts obviously puts more pressure on James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, and Tobias Harris to make up those almost 30 points a night the Sixers get from Embiid. In that regard, game one was an epic fail. Sixers kept it close in the first half once they got DeAndre Jordan off the floor. More on that on a minute because I really need to take Doc Rivers to task on that. Um, they outscored Miami 29 to 20 in the second quarter and actually took a one point lead into the into the intermission. But as Anthony, as I said to you when we were talking on the phone um, during halftime, I had a bad feeling that all the energy it took for Philly to come all the way back from a double digit deficit to take that halftime lead would come back to bite them and they'd run out of gas without Embiid in the second half. I thought it would be in the fourth quarter not barely into the second half. Philly shot the ball poorly, 38.5% from the floor in the second half after 47.5% in the first. They went 6 of 34 from the arc. That's 17.6%, guys. The three of us could shoot better than 17.6% from three. <laughs> Georgie Niang, 0 for 7. Danny Green, 1 for 5. Maxi 1 for 6. Bricked shots they normally drain. Yeah, Miami's toughness and pressure on the ball on defense. Provide a legitimate challenge, but the Sixers can't have those three shooting combined two of 18 from deep. With them beat out, Harden needed to channel the Houston version of himself and be much more aggressive on offense. That didn't happen in game one. Five of 13 from the floor, two of seven from deep. Only four trips to the line. He converted them. He only scored four points and only took four field goals in 15 second half minutes after putting 12 points up in almost 20 first half minutes. He's now gone 11 straight games, 12 counting tonight with less than 25 points. Not going to cut it. Five assists and five turnovers. One-to-one -one assist to turnover ratio ain't going to cut it either. Maxi was MIA in, in MIA in game one. Six of 15 from the floor. That one for six from the a minus 25 in 35 minutes. He and Harden, 35 points. 11 of 28 from the floor. Three of 13 from deep. Only 10 of 10 from the line. Seven assists, seven turnovers, which is practically half of 15 the 15 total turnovers that Philly have, Miami converted that into 22 points. Not going to cut it. Harris, only other six are in double figures in game one, 27 on 11 of 18 from the floor, but he was also minus 25 on the night. All right, now I'm going to get to the DeAndre portion of this rant, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> Doc can say that the players believe in Jordan all he wants and that they're going to continue to start him, but the numbers and the eye test, and if you want to go this far, the nose test, don't lie. Jordan is flat out unplayable. Rabbi, I said this to you when we were talking earlier in the day. Here's the stat that backs it up. Per cleaning the glass, Sixers were outscored by 13 and a half points per 100 possessions with Jordan on the floor in the regular season. In game one, Sixers were outscored by 12 points in the first four and a half minutes of the game with Jordan on the floor. He finished with a minus 17 in 22 minutes. They scored just 29 points on 33 offensive possessions. That's 0 0.88 per, while allowing 51 points on 32 defensive possessions, 1.59 per with Jordan on the floor. Obviously, I mean, B-ball Paul Reed would be the ideal option in this series, especially when you got to contend with Bam, Bam Adamayo. Lit up Philly, 24 points, 12 boards, 4 assists, 8 of 10 from the floor, 8 of 8 from the stripe. And when Reed replaced Jordan, which they did at that 4.5-minute mark in the first half, um, uh, you know, Philly made their run, uh, scoring Miami by four in his nine minutes. But while Reed gives the Sixers plenty of positives, more energy than Jordan, more switchability, some legitimate defensive playmaking, he also gives them one big honking negative. He can't stay out of foul trouble. Three fouls in those nine first half minutes, five and 13 total game minutes. You can live with that when Embiid's on the floor for 35 plus minutes, not when he's unavailable. 
without Philly, without Embiid, Philly allowed Miami to rebound a ridiculous 38 and a half percent of their misses during the part of the game where it was actually a game, according to cleaning the glass. Third, that led to 13 more shots by Miami, by Miami, which led to 18 second chance points. While going small with the likes of Neanger Harris at the five, maybe something Rivers doesn't really want to do. Jordan's unplayable and Reed is foul prone. He needs to go that route and attempt to win with five guys on the floor can actually knock down shots. He did do more of that tonight, though Niang fouling out kind of put a monkey wrench in that plan. Embiid could potentially return for games three and four in Philly if he clears concussion protocol, according to ES, according to Woj over at ESPN. But until then, Philly needs less of DeAndre Jordan, more of the Toronto series version of the Harden Maxi Harris trio in terms of offensive execution and production, and maybe a prayer to the basketball gods. I made that prayer was not answered tonight. Philly struggled with shot making, execution, and production. They were too ISO heavy at points with Harden and Maxi. Granted, those two combined for 27 of Philly's 52 first half points on 10 of 21 from the floor and six of eight from the stripe, but they went just one of four from downtown. Harris couldn't find the basket in the first half, three of 11, 0 of three from three, and no free throw attempts. Philly overall was four of 14 from downtown, 28.6%. Much of that, you know, due to Miami not allowing good looks and closing out well on defense, but also because Philly, again, just could not knock down shots. No one other than Farden and Maxi got to the line. Philly had just eight assists on 21 first half made field goals. So, early, you know, uh, granted, uh, Reed stayed out of foul trouble for most of tonight's game. But again, Jordan was unplayable. Niang fouling out didn't help with the small ball lineup that actually was the best type of lineup that they could put on the floor. Maxi put the team on his back uh, and did everything he could to keep him in this game. He finished with 34-23 in the second half. Harris finished with a solid second half. Um, you know, 21 on nine of 17, two of five from three. But Harden and the rest of the team continued their struggle to score. They could not knock down stuff from three overall. Green, one of nine. And that's the most, he was the most egregious defender. He's two of 15 in the series. And this is a guy they count on to knock down close to two out of every five. Uh, a lot of them were no open looks he normally drains. Miami got to the line, knocked down threes. And just like the first half, every time Philly got close, Butler, Adebayo, Hero, and Oladipo. Yes, that Victor Oladipo had an answer. Miami's up 2 nothing, guys, and it's not really a surprise. This is Philly without Embiid. They're more like a play-in game team that made the playoffs by the skin of their teeth than a top four seed with title aspirations. And, and I'll tell you what, too. Without, yeah, and I'll tell you what, too. Without Joel Embiid uh, in the middle, Miami, it just makes Miami defense so much, you know, so much – uh, tougher to score against because now they can just they can focus on just guarding the perimeter. We saw against Atlanta, um, as far as how they were able to switch off and defend Trey Young. It's almost the same thing with James Harden and and, and Maxi. They're just gonna switch off, and that's pretty much, and just make things yeah. tougher. Uh, Miami, I mean, number one defense in the NBA for a reason. And Joel and B, I felt like gave Philadelphia somewhat of an advantage of having an inside presence who can score. But um, yeah. without him in the lineup, and maybe maybe he come back as uh, the mass MB that we saw in 2018, uh, at some point in the series. But right now, Philadelphia, because it, it, it's also just like they just it's so it's so much energy just trying to get just get opportunities it's open looks. in the game. Yeah, and it just it's just like they just well they just get worn down by the by the time the third quarter comes around. And it's just they just look like a team that just ran out of gas. Yeah, uh, the wet. only one who seemed to have energy from the for the entire game was Maxi. But I mean, the kid's 21 years old. You'd expect him to have those type of legs, and you know he didn't seem to slow down at any point. Slow start, but he got untracked in that second half. He leads the NBA um, in points in transition in the playoffs, and you kind of saw a lot of that in the second half. Um, he got a lot of his points inside. He got to the line in the second half, but you just you look at Harden guys, and you just realize that I don't think we're going to ever see anything close to the Houston version of him ever again. Um, and, and how he is very much, he can't carry a team anymore. The fact that Max is the one who had to carry the team with Embiid out is, is kind of proof of that. Harden is a solid playmaker, but when he has to step up during any point in the game tonight where Maxi was getting his usual rest and, and Harden was out there with, you know, with subs, even with Harris on the floor with him, they just couldn't do anything. And, you know, when you're minus Embiid, you're forced to go with, with Jordan 
or, 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 or with Reed and you're going, you know, and you have situations where Thibault's playing on the wing um, and if Niang and, and Green aren't knocking down shots, you're playing two on five, three on five offensively and against a team that's, that's able to spread the ball around and get scoring from multiple players who are, have the ability to score in multiple ways. Uh, I mean, uh, but we saw this, you know, we've seen this before with this team, Butler out of bio and Harrow are on any given night. Those three are enough to, to, you know, to, to crush a team. But when Victor Oladipo drops 19 coming off the bench, I, I don't see how you beat this team. Rabbi, they're the one seed for a reason. And, and, you know, even with them beat out, you know, granted Embiid was out, but you know they looked they've looked like a number one seed these last two games, and no Kyle Lowry, and no Kyle Lowry in either yeah. of these two games, and uh, Oladipo's game five against Atlanta has changed it. I love the Miami Heat defense. Like you give the Miami Heat defense a fully stock team. They made Trey Young look about ninety nine percent less of the player than he was last year against the Knicks in that last series, and and. There's just no stopping them. And so you got good numbers from the big three tonight. Tobias Harris has had a pretty good series so far. And you still can't get enough points because there's just no. nothing that's really available. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I said. That depth you know, was kind of killed in that Harden game. That's yeah. very simple as that. It, it's that Curry simple. was a fourth and, scorer for this team. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, that you, you see how much of a, of a black hole – um is created a gaping hole is created with Embiid out um and I if he's healthy and can play his usual game oh. for games three and four in Philly oh he clears concussion protocol is fine I think hey, that's hey, almost okay. a guarantee right now but yeah, yes, you know look, especially after he saw it tonight I mean I, I think he's gonna browbeat right. the doctors into clearing them if, if there was even a doubt if he can and Philly can even up this series you know, then then you then they have a chance. Maybe. But if Miami steals one in Philly, yeah, which you can, which I can easily see happening. Hundred percent. There's no indication. Do, there's no indications you, that the Sixers yeah. still can get Embiid and still win. The exactly. Game. All right. This series goes back to Miami. Miami Philly down three one. They're going fishing. Yeah, and they might not even go back to Miami if Embiid doesn't play. Okay. Enough of the Sixers. God damn it. Enough of the Sixers. All right. Let's talk about both West series, and I want you guys to chime in a little bit in between, if you please. All right, let's start with uh, Memphis Golden State. And again, these two teams have played two classic games, and they basically come down to the final minute. I can watch these two teams in a best of 99 because I love offense, and there's been nothing boring about this series. There's been a lot of things we can talk about. We can talk about the heavy play in this the ejections of Brooks and Draymond Green in games two and one, uh, respectively. I don't know which one you would love to say, but that's something we can talk about. We can talk about the fact that the Warriors looked slow on defense for a good portion of that game, too, especially. Uh, the Warriors can still shoot themselves in back into a game, but if this go 18% from three, probably not going to win. You can talk about how Jordan Poole might be the key to this whole series, but you know what? Keep it simple, stupid. John Morant scored 47 points last night. And even though T. Morant might call that a very disappointing game for his son, this that's ushered T. Morant <laughs> to everybody else, John Morant is just amazing. And what you saw last night, he attacked the rim at every single point, scored the last 15 points in that game two, and he pretty much did exactly what he did in game five against Minnesota. And was there because that Memphis offense has almost got, got stagnant at fun last night. Desmond Bain doesn't look like himself he's injured. Brooks was out of the game and he may not be back for game number three if he gets a one game suspension, which he should. Jared oh Jackson God, yeah. Jr. Jared Jackson Jr. went from double double machine playing the game to his life to once again getting in foul trouble. What a surprise. And this team was basically the Josh show, and he just responded by doing exactly what he did in game one against the Sears against the Jazz last year. Enough, by the way, for uh, LeBron James to tweet, John Moran shouldn't have won the most improved player of the year because he's too big of a star. That's for another day. But uh, it, you don't get the production out of Bane. He won, obviously, had a big jump last year from 9.2 to 18.2 points per game it's gonna have to come to jump and we saw a little bit in the minnesota series where the grizzlies just made double digit comebacks like it was you know the easiest freaking thing in the world to do they're the first team 
to ever come back three times from double digit deficits in the fourth quarter. Now, from whatever you think it is, whether it be Minnesota choking or Minnesota holding Jot to 21.5 points per game, which is pretty good on 38.6% shooting from the field and 20% from three, the Timberwolves plan against Morant was always consistently swarmed to the paint on his drives to the basket, but the rest of the team got rewarded for that because everybody was open. And how did that work in game five when they, they had everybody in the basket? Yeah, Ja kind of got past them. Didn't work in game one of the Warriors series, though. And that performance, Anthony, brought Patrick Beverly to go to Twitter today and say, 47 piece? Didn't happen in our series. You're also sitting at home, Patrick, so get over yourself. Gotcha. But overall, yeah, you know the Warriors what? I think awesome. if, yeah, I think if you are not familiar with John Moran or have been living on a rock the last few years, you'll find out that John Moran is a stud. I mean, let's just be honest. He's a, he is a, uh, he is, you know, he's, he's a block, he's, he's boss office. I hate to, hate to call Steve A. Smith on that, but yes, John Moran, he's yeah, show that. But he's absolutely boss office. Yeah. Yeah, he's absolutely is. But the thing is what with, with John Moran is the fact that it's not just the fact that he is such a great player. He's a great teammate. Did you see what he did uh with his most improved player award uh, a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, he had always um, yeah, he had always basically said to him that he thought Desmond Bain, who again had a nine point jump from this from last season to this season, should have won it. So he gave him the award because he thought he deserved it. Again. Another story for another time, but I think if yeah. John Morant plays, uh, continue. Yeah, but or also I'll just say too is I think that the physical play of this of these first two games is really kind of oh I God. think quite a lot of people by surprise, but also um, I think it set the tone in game one. You saw the the the, the flagrant foul for Draymond Green, and then obviously the. <clears throat> the foul that said that like uh Gary Payton a throw out of the uh, pretty much out of the series and that's a tough break for um, he a young man that's really the NBA finals that's really as the yeah. Yeah. today. Yeah. Been, yeah. Like, very unfortunate for a, a young a young man that's played very well and has really kind of found his own niche um in the league. But the physicality of this series I think is really has taken on a life of its own. You heard what Steve Kerr said after game two, uh, it'd be interesting to see with the series going back to San Francisco, um, how much would the refs um, be an impact as far as trying to limit some of the some of the the, the, the hard fouls, maybe uh, cut down on some of the little extra contact you probably would have gotten away with uh, only in the first two games. So it'd be very interesting to see what's, what's going to happen as far as officially. Let me stop you right there for a second really quick. I think the comment that you were referring to was uh, uh, a reporter at the who had, who had said beforehand that he expected a game that was physical. And then they asked him at halftime, what did you think about that play? You said the series would be physical. He said, that's not physical. That's dirty. And that's yeah. absolutely what that was. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, Rabbi, you and I talked about it, you know, this afternoon on the phone. You know, the, the comparison between, you know, uh, Green pulling Clark down by the jersey. Yeah, that's an obvious flagrant, too. You get ejected for it, you know. I think it was obvious, by the way. I thought it was an obvious flagrant, too, by it, it, it was only a flagrant, too, after, like, the second viewing when you see it again. This, right. well, the Brooks play was a flagrant, oh, yeah. too. And, I, and I, don't, I don't contest that one shape, manner, or form. The only difference to me is is that th- there uh, there is no place in basketball – for what Brooks did. Uh, you look at that play, you can look at that play six ways from Sunday and there's no way anyone on Memphis's side can justify that in any shape, manner or form. He took off, he clearly swung at the head. There is there was no way in that that was anything close to a, a basketball play. And as Steve Kerr said in his post-game comments, Brooks broke the code. You do not, you play tough, you play physical. This is the playoffs. We understand that. But you do not do anything that endangers a player's season and or, you know, slash career. And that is what Brooks did. Peyton is out for three weeks. It's a fractured elbow. This is a guy who was being counted on 
as the primary defender on Morant. And you saw what happened once he wasn't available. Morant yeah. had a went off. I mean, in the place where you would have seen Gary Payton uh, the most would have been late in that game, down stretch front of the fourth quarter, closing slash winning time. And that is where Morant went off, scoring 18 points in the fourth quarter, the last 15 of the Grizzlies point, you know, points to win that game. So that's okay. obvious. I mean, it's it to me that's a cheap play. It took a guy out of the series that 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 is very much needed by the Warriors. What's it's going to be interesting. I, I still think this is going to be an interesting series. And Rabbi, as you said, I still think it's going to be the most fun to watch. What what was interesting to me is is after Morant missed that last second layup in game one and he slumped against the stanchion, Steph Curry went over to him and said, you know, it's all right. It's a battle. We're going to have some fun. After Morant closed out game two, he said the same thing to Curry. We're going to have some fun. So already. The yeah. Well, the one and the one thing you need to mention is the future fact. MVP should, uh, again, a little bit of a subplot uh, yeah, in the series that is rife with them. And one thing you didn't mention is the fact that Gary Payton the second followed followed Morant that whole entire final play, making that layup almost impossible. Okay, exactly. Uh, other series. I uh, don't know a lot about. Oh, right. it. There's yes, another one going on, and it's actually happening tonight. Game two is tonight. Yes, yes, yes. Game two is right now, actually. Uh, right. Game one, the Suns were playing, starting to play with the fuller deck. Devin Booker, who was injured in game two of the Pelican series, uh, came back in game six. By the way, props to the Pelicans and props to the Suns when you were missing your best player and the Pelican season is considered a success after going <laughs> six wrong games with that team good on them that was a very fun series but yeah. the Suns are better when they are healthy and Devin Booker needed to be healthy game six against the Pelicans he was not healthy he did play eight minutes over his minutes restriction that he had in that game of 24 scored 13 points but his main goal out there was for people to draw into him so other players could get the ball and Chris Paul had the went 14 for 14, the most efficient shooting game that we've ever seen outside of the playoffs, outside of a guy named Will Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. So that's just a name that you might want to remember. So Devin Booker played a little bit better in game number one of the series. He only had 23 points and didn't do too well anyway on some of the 20 shooting, but he had nine rebounds and eight assists. And he had 17 potential assists in game one. So you want to convert about half of what is considered your potential assists, and that's a good night. And uh, Chris Paul didn't really do a lot in that game. He only had five potential assists and only three actual dimes. Jake Crowder actually had the second most potential assists. But you're going to need Devin Booker to score more in this series because Phoenix is still a lot of role players. You can get your typical, you can get your one-off game of 30 from the Kale Bridges. That happened in game five. You can get that one-off game from a lot of players on this team. You can get Jay Crowder. Jay Crowder's already got 15 tonight. You can get so many players, but you need stars. And Booker is the guy that'll help you go from a team that can make the Western Conference Finals to a team that can win an NBA championship. So needs to be healthy, and very simply, he has. One shout-out to DeAndre Ayton of the Suns. That man needs to get paid in the offseason because there's always a question going into last season, can he really be the five on a team that can win a championship? And the answer is solely yes, 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 and yes, considering yes. he's yes. done for 20 points in almost every single game. And for the very awesome comment by Jason Kidd, we're not going up against Rudy Gobert and Hassan Whiteside in this series. We're going up against a guy who could actually score. Now, Aiden only has nine tonight. And as mentioned, Jake Crowder is actually leading the Suns with 15. And the, the uh, bench from the Mavericks did nothing in game one. And Luca just went for 40 plus, you know, Luca doing Luca things. And tonight, Luca is really way doing to Luca. that tonight. 24 <laughs> points, 9 of 14. He is 24, 4, and 6 on the night. I love watching Luca play. And 
if somebody else could step up, Spencer Dinwiddie is a plus 10 and 10 points out there. Bertans plus 10 and 9. Cleaver, who had a lot of interesting games in that Jazz series, plus mm-hmm. 10 and 6. If anybody can start producing on that team, you have three minuses in uh, that starting lineup for the Mavericks tonight. Finney Smith minus 7. Yeah, minus but, two, but, Powell oh, minus geez. 8. Yeah, but it the in Maver- are in the first half. Maver- but the Mavericks are up. 60 to 50 yeah. because you know, it's Yeah, very simply because it's Luca versus all. And Luca yeah. can it, do it himself. And if you yep. don't have the all from Phoenix, it might be a Phoenix. Yeah, hey, you know what? They're I'll only just... up two. They're only up two. And if you get the feeling, and I do, that Booker has yet to really get on track. Yeah, Chris Paul's really yet to get untracked. If those guys start getting untracked in the second half, Luca alone isn't going to be enough. I mean, no, absolutely, really absolutely not. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, I'm kind of, dis- I'm kind of surprised Jalen Brunson struggled tonight. He's just one of five or two points. Uh, he, he obviously Jalen Brunson played very well against Utah. I, I think he get anything out of him in the second half. I can see Dallas possibly still in this game because right now they're not they're not they're not beating a, a Phoenix Suns team with so much depth as far as scoring and being able to get point get point production from all these different areas even off the bench. Uh, just Luka Doncic by himself. I mean, you get the Suns right now. Uh, like you said, Devin Booker and Chris Paul really having it's kind of have maybe a, a kind of an average close half. Um, but they have they can go to other scoring options. They can get um they got Aiden, they got Crowder, they got uh they got Cameron Payne, guys who can chip in and score. Uh so I mean in this as far as the second half, it's gonna be interesting to see well guys gonna get the additional offense because right now it's literally just been Luca versus the world uh to the first game and a half of the series. And eventually, you gotta wonder. I mean, he's human. He's gonna have to. He's gonna have to wear it out at some point, right? Is he? And I love watching Luca play, but uh, I mean, I mean, man, he, he, even if he does it, <laughs> you gotta. I don't see how Dallas sustains. Is he a robot? I, mean, I think he is. Gotta be something. But maybe <laughs> I don't see how Dallas sustains. You know, sustains. Uh, you know, a ten of twenty from from beyond the arc first half. I don't see. I don't see how that's they can sustain that. And if that three-point shooting drops a little bit back to earth, and, and and Phoenix plays its usual basketball, that two-point lead is not is not is not sustainable either. Especially if no one other than Luca really steps up to you know to do some some damage uh, against Phoenix. Right now they're they're up by two largely because Luca's being Luca, and they're ten of twenty from beyond the arc. That's and that's nothing too. I don't know if you want what? to get into that's that kind it. of. Yeah, I don't know if you might get into a, a three point shooting contest with a Suns team that can't shoot the three. This isn't Utah. Utah, their three point shooting was kind of the weakness and kind of downfall uh, for most of the season. The Suns, um, um, one of the top three point shooting teams in the league. Not only do they make it a, a high efficiency, but they get quality three point opportunity and great looks because of uh, Chris Paul being a playmaker and Devin Booker. Yeah. Uh, Getting so much attention from the defenses, and you have prominent shooters who just kind of space out, um, space out around the perimeter. So yeah. Dallas has got to figure out uh, how to at least generate some more offense, not rely so much on a three point shooter. Maybe try to get to the foul line a little more, also. And here's a couple of and here's a couple of interesting notes on that. I mean, you talk about we talked about Brunson struggling. You know, he was in foul trouble. He had three in the first half, as did, as did Finney Smith, who they rely upon for some defense, and Bertrands, also three in the first half. Uh, I mean, Phoenix was 14 of 17 from the – 14 of 16 from the strike. So, I mean, even if Dallas continues to shoot well from the arc, if they keep getting into foul trouble and, and Phoenix keeps, you know, earning their pay at the line, uh, that fourth quarter is going to be interesting. Hey. The only thing I make this really good if we see Boban tonight come off the bench. Maybe. Never, I, I don't think we're going to be seeing <laughs> Boban too much in this area unless someone's been. Okay. Hey, you can take on, hey, you can take, hey, if you can take on John Wick, you can take on Chris Paul and Devin Booker, okay? Hey, uh, Wick, 
Rick got him in the end, so I don't know if you should use that as any type of thing. <laughs> That's true. That's not really. You can take him on, but you can't win. Okay. Finally tonight, it seems like eons ago that the Nets were in the playoffs, and that's because it really has been. Okay, it's only been nine days, but when you're the only team swept in a season where we were the betting... Can you let me finish my own words? Jesus. But when you were the only team swept in a season... No, you can't, apparently. When you were the only team swept in a season where you were the betting favorite in Vegas to win it all... I think this season for all 10 actual Brooklyn Nets fans has seemed like a millennium. Let's post boredom. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, Rabbi, only 10? There's got to be more than that outside Anthony's window alone. Come on now. Not, no, not true Nets fans. Those are just. Just me. He said actual Nets fans, not actual Nets fans. Not Brooklyn Nets. Okay. Oh, okay. Not, okay. not people who are actually wearing a jersey that says. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. okay. And yes, I said Harding, not anybody else. Okay. <laughs> Jay, give me a yes, positive. Sir. And never before has a positive gone one from 11 in the free throw, from the free throw line in a game. But here we are talking about the. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, uh, that that to me is the, you know, the positive takeaway from the season is Nick Claxton's um, development. Yeah, look, Kevin Durant's stellar play is the captain obvious choice for this, you know, for this angle, you know, from this season. But we've talked about, you know, KD almost at ad nauseum. So I wanted to find, you know, another positive takeaway for this postmortem. Um, and honestly, I was surprised how tough it was. Um Claxton, despite missing 37 games, mostly due to injury, did set career highs in most statistical categories and made himself a big part of Steve Nash's rotation, especially down the stretch and in that first round playoff series against the Celtics. Played the last 21 games of the season after battling injuries, averaging 20.6 minutes off the bench, 8.3 points per game, 5.9 boards and assists and half a steal and 1.1 blocks while shooting 72.1% from the floor. That worked out to some excellent per 36-minute numbers, 15.2 points per game on 67% from the floor, 9.8 boards, 1.6 assists, along with almost one steal and almost one and a half blocks. Career best in per 100 possession numbers, uh, had a 130 offensive rating and a 111 defensive rating. And when paired with Durant, Irving, Patty Mills, and Bruce Brown, they formed a unit that was plus 43.8 points per 100 possessions better than their opponents during the regular season and was the only quintet that played at least 15 minutes together against Boston and had a positive points per minute possession uh, per 100 possessions at plus 1.6. Speaking of Boston, Claxton continued his solid play into that series, uh, averaging 24 and a half minutes per game, 10 and a half points, 6.3 boards, 1.85 assists, 1.3 steals and 2.3 blocks shooting 79.2% from the floor, given the Nets inside scoring and solid defense. The only real negative here were his struggles at the line, which were much worse in the playoffs than the regular season, where he shot 58.1%. Average five and a half trips to the stripe, including 11 in that series finale, which Rabbi alluded to, uh, going one for 11 in those those attempts, missing his first 10. Um, Shot only 18.2%. For the series at the line, one for three, uh, three, 11, three for 11 in games, one through three, and that one 11 or 11 in game four where he missed his first 10. Um, if he can manage to stay healthy, Claxton gives the Nets a six foot 11 defender who can switch one through five, has some guard skills that the Nets can try and develop. Uh, as head coach Steve Nash said after the Boston series, quote, Nick made such a big impact for us defensively with his athleticism, foot speed, and length. He protects the rim. We're able to switch. He also brings pace offensively, flying in on pick and rolls, diving hard, getting on the glass, end quote. The combination of his skill set and size are hard to find in the association, so the Nets should do whatever they can to keep him in Brooklyn. They can offer Claxton a one-year qualifying offer of $2.3 million on June 29th, and it would behoove them to do so. Agreed. Um, yeah. There's not a lot, you're right, there's not a lot to take from this season as positive, and that's all because of Anthony's negative going into the season. For one last time in 2022, <laughs> before the summer, please rant about Kyrie Irving. Uh, you, know, you know, and I have to put this point out there, and Rabbi, you're, you're probably chiming on this too. Some of the blame has to go to the Brooklyn Nets front office. I mean, a player only gets away with so much if you enable them to do so. 
I've seen it in the past with the Knicks and Stephon Marbury. I've seen it plenty of times over. And in the case of Kyrie Irving, yes, the Nets let him get away with quite a bit, but a lot of it was just Kyrie being Kyrie in most cases. Look, the Nets were title contenders before the season started. And as much as Kyrie doesn't want to, maybe it doesn't calculate to him, his choice of to not get vaccinated actually affected the rest of the team without question. Because mm -hmm. when you're talking about this player is not available for 75% of the games, that kind of trickles down and hurts your team. But here's the point. But here's the thing. The Nets were 21 and 12 and three games ahead of everyone in the Eastern Conference back in late December when the Nets front office decided initially after saying that Kyrie Irving was not going to be a part-time player to now allow Kyrie Irving to be a part-time player. The problem with that was two things. Number one, how did that was going to affect the rest of the locker room? We saw what happened with James Harden and that being part of the reason why he left. Number two, whatever contract negotiation you were going to have, you were completely giving away any kind of leverage because now Kyrie Irving had no reason to basically do what anything the team would tell him to do let alone show up for work. How are how your best player only playing less than 30% of the games? I mean, 30 games a season, the regular season. And then in the and then the playing tournament, think about this. He plays, he played very well, but he played very well in sports. For the for the 60 point game, he gave he 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 gave uh he gave us uh, in Orlando. It was a lot of six for 18 and seven for 19 shoot performances where he eventually, where he eventually did what was allowed to play at the Barclays Center. In the playoffs, he had outside the one game, uh, the one fourth quarter in game one, he was pretty much MIA. Not to mention the Twitter rant he went on last week, I guess, yeah, calling media members, uh, pawns and peons and all this other stuff. Now, granted, you have nothing to say about them when they're praising you for your, for your great play uh, mm -hmm. as a ball player, but when they disagree with you, everyone, your, your name calling. I mean, look, I, look, I hate bashing and piling on Kyrie Irving. I think everyone has have done enough of it this season, but the obvious is still, I mean, look, you, you don't get the, look, as far as Kyrie Irving, you made a postal choice, which is your postal choice. I had no problem with that. As far as and, and I felt you playing part time was more of the team making a, a decision that backfired than anything. But you don't get to be Kyrie Irving and get to play the role of victim and Marnif, as he called himself earlier today, um, and still and, and try and, and they can change the narrative on this, okay? Your postal choice. Um, did hurt the team for, for better or for worse, and you can't make it about your teammates when you didn't think about them when you decided to make a personal decision for yourself. So it's basically it's like mm -hmm. everyone else in that locker room chose the team, you chose yourself. And you think about this: Kevin Durant gave up Steph Curry and Clay Thompson to play with you in Brooklyn, and ever since then he's only won one playoff series since. So. How much? So it's been basically the same, a new team, same Kyrie Irving. I mean, I said it for I, I said it when he was at Duke. There was a bit of it as good talent as he was. There was a bit of an issue there. Mike Mike Krzyzewski even said he came out of college a little too early. Um, in his early days in Cleveland, he had issues with both Byron Scott and Mike Brown as head coaches. Got into and a few teammates. Yeah, there was a few teammates. Then LeBron came in. LeBron should want to know about Peace Prize to keep – how the hell did LeBron manage to win a championship and get to a couple of NBA Finals appearances with Kyrie as a teammate? It's beyond me. But he won it out of there, won this whole team with the Boston. That didn't work out so well. And then, obviously, I mean, taking shots at the, the Boston fans to, um, after a regular season game uh, – this past uh, last month, uh, calling uh, um, you know, obviously comparing them to a scoring X, then the the, the actress the game one with the middle finger and all that other stuff. And, and the worst part of all this was, did anybody look more happy 
that the next season ended in Brooklyn and Kyrie Irving, that he didn't have to go back to Boston and deal with that fan base yet again. I think, look, I think for what is world, some, like, I think if Kyrie wants to take a step away from basketball, that may be the best day. But from the next standpoint, what in the, you do not give this man a long-term deal whatsoever. I mean, he's shown he's not reliable. He doesn't show up for work. When you give him a little leeway, he pretty much takes it a, hundred, a whole 99 yards as if he's totally doing set one out of, out, of out of a stadium. Um, this, is, like, this is a guy that has just shown that if he opts out, move him. That's the best yeah. thing you can do for the Nets. You don't have any trade assets. Ben Simmons is going to have back surgery. You have your know, whale over the cap. He's literally your only traded asset right now. And you don't even know if you can trade him because Kyrie can always say, I'm going to retire if you move him. So I think the best thing for the Nets right now is if Kyrie opts in, you may, you you push your foot down because I think the, the front office, I think the whole thing, like with Kyrie, from the moment he decided not to get vaccinated, it kind of set, a, it really was a set down, a, a chain reaction to the next season as everything just yeah. went wrong. Even when they were in first place and they had to bounce with COVID, it seemed like the Nets were, that Christmas night game when they beat the Lakers, it said the Nets was going to be able to kind of survive and pull through and at least stay out of playing. But it seemed like the mood around the team changed when Kyrie was allowed to be a part-time player. And basically the team put, Ky- I mean, the, the Nets put Kyrie above the rest of the locker room, and it—I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't want to make too much. I'm, I'm, I'm not making too much. What you're trying but to do it is did kind feel of like, yes. It did feel Anthony. like the next whole thing just changed Anthony. when that and it happened because because yeah. yeah. Hold on, Andrew, hold on. Before you guys say yeah. anything, before it's yeah. two people agreeing and then my words being a little meaningless, I agree with yeah. most of what you're saying. I do think <laughs> though that you are putting in that this is an organizational. Failure you're putting it as, oh, well, they decided to allow Kyrie to play and everyone got pissed. No, I think Kyrie is just a terrible teammate, and I think he's just not the type of guy who is worth a long term contract. You're absolutely right. But you do have to, and also, by the way, the LeBron suffered through Kyrie in Cleveland. Please, Kyrie made the shot that gave LeBron in Cleveland. But who so made the block? That was that was free. That was <laughs> free, and you can always get into everything it. else. But but that was that was a lot. There's a difference between pre Diva Kyrie in 2018 and post Diva Kyrie is what we got now. Well, uh, Rabbi, here, I I understand where you're coming from, and and in principle, I agree with you. But here's the thing: pre Kyrie, what you had with pre Diva Kyrie was you had immature Kyrie, which that started. And it was still some. Who people would tell not to do that, and he would listen half of the time. Uh, half the time, and this is the but thing. It's it, now, uh, yeah, it's hundred percent because now he's made his money. Now he's made, you know, he's he's got his status, you know, with all the con with the with the money he's made, the contracts he's gotten, you know, and, and the level at which he is he's he plays at when he actually is playing well. But here is the thing. And, and honestly, it's been this way, as far as I'm concerned, it's been this way since Duke. Kyrie, is, there has never been any doubt about his ability to put the ball in the bucket. One of the best bucket getters ever to, ever to lace him up in, in, in recent NBA history. There's no doubt about that. But for me, the ju- everything else that comes along with it, the juice is not worth the squeeze. He has burned bridges in every organization he's ever played with, he's going to do the same here. And even if KD never, never once bad mouths him, no matter how this offseason plays out or when this partnership dissolves, because and it'll dissolve with Kyrie bolting, not Durant leaving. Um, I have a feeling Durant will never say a bad word about him publicly. We will never know if if Kevin Durant has ever told Kyrie. Come on already, you know, stop being a selfish you-know-what. Because here's the thing, Kyrie is selfish. Kyrie is all about Kyrie. He is a lousy teammate. He does not give a damn. And Anthony has said it best. He is the epitome of give someone an inch, they will take a mile. 
And that is what Kyrie does. And that he won, he's not capable of leading a team. You saw what happened in Boston. The minute Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum realized we can win without him, we don't need him. What happened? Kyrie caused drama. He caused problems. He made, he made a mess of things. Why? Because a team that was supposed to be his team is not his team. Here in Brooklyn, the only reason he's not doing that to KD is out of respect for the friendship these two guys have. And hopefully their friendship can survive whatever the fallout of this season or the next season is going to be, because this this thing was always going to end badly because Kyrie can't help but be Kyrie. Leopards don't change their spots. The scorpion is always going to sting the frog because that's his nature. That's Kyrie. He's going to give you 25 points a night when he actually steps on the floor, but he's going to cause you so much more agita that then that that makes that in my mind not worth it. I understand why they made the decision organizationally to let him play part time because they desperately did not want to punt on this season. But in all honesty, with everything else that went down around them, they should have. They should have held firm, kept him out, taken the hit, and then they should have gotten rid of him or said, "Look, you want to stay here? You want to get paid? Get your ass vaccinated." Then they should have told they, they they should have kept to that hard line and, and punted on the season, because honestly, I, I don't think that the way things ended out this season was worth it. wasn't worth the agita. It just wasn't. Okay, before you say it, no, they should never. You should never punt on the season when you have Kevin Durant on your team. I'm sorry, and you want to ask. So this is the lead to my point. The that seemed to decide what kind of an organization are they? when they had the nucleus before they built and got KD and Kyrie, and you needed the nucleus to get there. They were a well, decently run organization under the guide of Kenny Atkinson, who might just be getting the job in Sacramento. With all that said, who's doing a very good job, by the way, on the bench, I can say right now. With all of that said, getting KD is a huge step, but you're only getting KD to win a title. Kevin Durant is at the point of his career. He's won two championships. He will not settle for less, especially in this era of player empowerment. What you, you have per, what you have currently is not working. Yes, I think Kyrie, you should not punt on the season. And I think this, I agree with what Jay said in terms of you needed Kyrie to at least have bodies. Perfectly fine. But Kyrie is not a member of the organization. I don't give a F what he did Tuesday on last week because. Once he disappears from the playoffs, he should disappear from the public eye immediately. But when he said everybody is going to go in and me and Joe and Kevin are going to determine what this team is going to be, no person who wanted, who didn't win a fucking game in a single series should ever say that line. You should be begging to keep your job at that point and begging to have a long-term contract. Kyrie Irving is in the dream world. The organization needs to decide... If Kyrie Irving, if Kyrie Irving stays on this team, which I agree, he should not. And I think if you let him go, he's probably going to be out of the league because he's either going to choose a better situation or he's just not going to play. And honestly, not going to play is the best thing for him. But once you get rid of Kyrie and Ben Simmons is now on that on back surgery injury, and I don't think he may ever play a game for the Brooklyn Nets. With that being said, once you have that, you have no depth on that team whatsoever. You mentioned Nick Claxton and Seth Curry. You're going to get Joe Harris back. That's fine. Those are building pieces, but not building pieces for a championship contender. You're going to need to find the most for Kevin Durant because at that point, Kevin Durant is not a leader. Is not a leader of men. He is not the bus driver, as Charles Barkley said, because a real bus driver would tell Kyrie that what he's doing is ridiculous. A real bus driver would have solved this situation so the big three can still play as the big three and get more than, I don't know, 15 to 25 games again with each other. A real bus driver would a real bus driver would at least be able to park the team when he can't play, which they didn't do. So the Nets need to decide very simply. Do you keep Steve Nash? Do you believe in what Steve Nash is doing? I, I like do. Steve Nash a lot. I don't because I think he got destroyed by Adoka in this series. You need to talk to him and you need to see 
what his plan is for the future and can he handle a rebuild? Because the way this team ended their season, what makes you think that they're going to do anything better next year? And even if they do anything better, is this a fifth or fourth place team? Maybe. But honestly, Maybe. they're not a championship contender right no, now. They're not. And if that's no. the case, you decide who's running the organization, and it should be the owners. Spoiler alert, not the two players who have won a who didn't win a single game this postseason. You need to decide who's on the bench, and you need to decide if you want to win now or build for the future. And the Nets are used to losing. I'm sorry to say. There are years where they are a 27 win team, but they have a nice arena in Brooklyn. They have a few thousand people as a fan base. They have a great place to play. They'll get players back. But if you do this with KD and Kyrie again, those who failed to learn from history repeat it. Very simple as that. If you want yeah. to do this with KD alone, you're going to have a very unhappy and passive-aggressive KD. Good luck on that. If you yeah, want um, to do this the right way, you need to build a kick. Yeah, and I was just out there because, we, you know, guys, we did a, a Knicks postmortem at the beginning of the playoffs. So let me just throw this out there now that we've done a postmortem on both of these teams. Uh, based on our, you know, on both postmortems, which team do you think right now, if, I, if I'm going to put you both on the spot, which team in your head right now has the has the brighter future, at least the brighter Knicks. immediate future? Knicks. Knicks. The that Knicks. gave us so more depth, that's, has so much more young talent. They just need to mature a little bit. And they need a right guy to be a semi-leader. The problem this year, I hate to say it, was Randall. And I think yes. that was probably the biggest problem with this team. But everybody else improved in increments. And I think the question is going to arise if somebody is about, and this is going to be a quick tangent. And I, didn't, and I sort of answered this to end. If somebody like Donovan Mitchell is available in the offseason, you're going to lose a couple of those people, but you're going to get a guy who can lead your team consistently to the playoffs. But you need you need to wonder what is the price to get a name in New York that can play consistently, and that's going to be the big question. But the Knicks have the better future just because of the amount of people on that team that's under 26 years old. Yeah, and I was saying it. Uh, I was saying this too about the Knicks is that, by the way, Donovan Mitchell was at a, was at the Met game a few nights ago, so I just don't let little Tim it out. There. Not, not that we should but, read anything into that. <laughs> it was kind of orange and blue, but that besides the point. Uh, we looked at the, 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 the Nets, and I had said this all season long, and the question was, wh who was the locker room leader? And, and I remember last season how much how important Jeff Green was in that locker room. Yep. It wasn't just yep. the fact that he was able to produce and, and, and chip, get, chip in, but he was kind of the guy who were, who, who got the attention of the rest of the team. And, and Kevin Durant is a great player, a Hall of Famer, but he's not a guy who's going to jump in anybody's face. He's not no. a, a locker room leader. And I always no. said that the best player don't always have to be the team leader. It just needs to no. be a guy that can command respect that the rest of the teammates can look at, that can lead by words and by example. And we saw it with the Knicks. That was supposed to be Julius Randle, but we saw just how bad that went from the from the thumbs down to the knocking the laptop out. Actually, of Anthony, it went think, pretty bad. That, that went sideways because Randall just figured he had to be that guy because the guy who it really was was Derrick Rhodes, and Rhodes was spent most of the season on the disabled list. And, and Taj Gibson, who's the, the Thibodeau whisperer, for whatever reason, couldn't, you know, couldn't do the same thing. But that team needs Rose as a locker room leader because Randall has shown that he's not really that guy, just like Durant's not that guy in the locker room in, in, in Brooklyn. You need somebody, I agree with you, like a Jeff Green, like Andre Iguodala in, in Golden uh, State. Guys, uh, guys I, I was, have I was that point, type of respect yeah, I, and that type know, of respect. Yeah, and I was pointing to Chauncey Billups uh, when he was in Denver and how Carmelo Anthony was the all-star and, and the button Hall of Famer, but Chauncey Billups was the, the leader, the locker room guy. 
and also in with his days with the Pistons, and you had all these these great these great players. But mm-hmm. Chauncey Billups was kind of the locker room guy. You see with the Golden State Warriors with Draymond Green. He's not and, the best player, but yep. the, the 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 respect he commands for the rest of the team just it speaks volumes. And both New York teams, I mean, in the case of Derrick Rose, him being injured, but the Nets. They really needed it this season with everything they went through. Even the plan, it seemed like it's like this is a humbling experience that I don't think it's really set in for both Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. I don't think it ever will for, for Kyrie. <coughs> Excuse me. But for a guy like Kevin Durant, um, to be sweat, and I know he's he, like he has a passive aggressive personality, he's very defiant. Mm-hmm. Um, he won't, there's a lot of things he may, may not say publicly or he'll hint at with Wink. Um, but for but he's also a prideful basketball player. He's a prideful player. He knows his, his he's a he's a basketball historian in his own right. Deep down behind closed doors, being swept the and playing as poor as he did, has gotta sink in at some point when he just to sit down, the offseason just start to really sink in. And I think that's it's gonna it's gonna trigger something. I think he's gonna come back, he's gonna play very well as always. But for the Nets, and, 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 and like Rabbi I said, they got to figure out a culture. Because right now, between them and the Lakers, another team that tried to go the super, the super team route and it blew up in our faces, they really got to figure out which direction they're going to go. Because right yeah. now, what they're doing, it's not working. No, and here's the thing. You talk about Nash. And the difference, one of the bigger differences between this year and last year is – Nash was missing his consigliere. You, you can't underestimate how much having Dan Tony as a sounding board, as a guy who's been there and done that and gone through everything had, you know, helped him in his first year as a head coach, not having that guy. Yeah. Losing Adoka to, to Boston, you know, that, that, that hurt big in terms of, you know, schematically on defense, but not having Dan Tony, a guy who's been who he's been connected to for his entire almost his entire professional career and not having him as a sounding board and having, you know, that type of guy, you know, Rabbi, you and I talked earlier in the year about the impact of, of Phil Martelli on Jawan Howard at Michigan. And I think Dan Tony had that same effect on Nash last year. You can't underestimate how much not having that guy impacts you know, the, the decisions you make as a head coach, if you don't feel like you have that, that person as a sounding board to bounce things off of, to whisper in your ear, to help you check yourself before you wreck yourself, not only when you're making, you know, off-court decisions, but on-court decisions, if they can, I think if you're going to keep Nash, you need to find somebody like that to plunk alongside of him who can be that guy that Dan Tony was for him. I think if you can do that, That'll help steady the coaching staff and steady Nash, and he can kind of take that next step forward. But Rabbi, I completely agree with you. This organization needs to decide what direction it's going to go in because you cannot simply run this back. That to me is, I agree with you, that is not an option. That is not going to get you where you want to go as an organization. That's not going to get Durant where he envisioned himself being when he, when, when he decided to come here. Uh, they, they they need to decide who they're going to be and who because who they are right now just ain't cutting it exactly and uh one more thing they need a coach who's going to coach i love nash to, i like nash as a coach very much but you need someone who's going to yell at the players and not necessarily consigliere to the players you have players you have coaches that can do that but you need to do that for pe- for players who are leaders. And again, and by the way, Kevin, our Twitter handle is at O-N-T-H Sports Line. So you can use one of your burner accounts to say this right now. You're not a leader. You have two championships where you were 1B to Steph Curry's 1A. Not necessarily saying you were on a different level. You were on the same level, but it wasn't your team. Just a heads up. You are still a champion but you are not a champion leader. Not going to miss the Hall of Fame, but you won two titles basically as a one B. Very simple as that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm done. We're all done. Let's get out of here. (laughs)
for Jay Kaplan and Anthony Strait, I'm Stephen Rabinowitz. Thank you for joining us tonight. Socials, facebook.com slash on the sports lens to watch this show live. And if you're doing so right now, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> YouTube.com slash on the sports lines to see the show again whenever you want. And if you're watching this on May 5th, happy Cinco de Mayo. And Jay, what is that Elon Musk run website? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 it, it's O N T H sports lines, as you just referenced uh, to uh, Kevin, in case you want to use that burner account. And uh, we're going to do our best to kind of stay under uh, Elon's radar because, you know, we don't want to get canceled by him. <laughs> Uh, we actually uh, put up a couple of very nice uh, we put up a couple of nice things today if you haven't already seen what happened in Toronto last night with the Toronto Blue Jay fan catching Aaron Judge's home run and then turning around and handing it to a young Yankee fan we've got two links to things uh, up on our Twitter page that you should kind of take a look at Talking by the way that. shout out to Anthony straight four and one at Met games this year once again proving that he really is the luck of the charm of the, uh, is the lucky charm for the New York Mets, so. <laughs> yeah, I just want to put this out there, Kevin. I'm all about the smoke, so please come at me, bro. I have all the time and energy in the world. I've been blocked by, I've been blocked by bigger celebrities than you, so please come at me. <laughs> I just called Stephen A. Smith a bigger celebrity with, than Kevin Durant. On that note, good night from other hey, I mean, hey, look. One won a championship, one showed up on one life to live. So I give him a little bit pass, okay? For the one All life to live? Anyway, yeah. good night. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.